everyone. My name is Barbara Chandler and I am the manager of the Hannibal Square Heritage Center. And we are here with Jane Turner, who is our featured artist. Today we are highlighting Jane Turner in her artist talk and Jane is going to explore more about her collection that has been on exhibition here now for about three months, The Evolution of an Artist. Please help me in welcoming Jane Turner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is the first time actually that I've had an exhibition here and uh, I'm just uh, really happy to be here. I chose the topic evolution of an artist simply to show that I've grown over a period of time. I sometimes think that uh, I've only been doing art for maybe a short period of time, but when I really look back, it's been about 30 years. I started in 1990 and I was really motivated by many of the artists that I've met at the Zora Neale Hurston Festival. Uh, when I say evolution of an artist, uh, I'm saying that in the spirit of, of Sankofa. Sankofa is an Adinkra symbol and it comes from the Ashanti people in Ghana. Uh, in 2018, I had the, the great pleasure of visiting Ghana or West Africa for the first time. And it was very important to me because I felt that West Africa was a place where my people probably left the continent uh, during the, the commercial slave trade. trade. Uh, so my, my work actually is sort of uh, referencing, referencing some of the, um, the work, some of the people that I met and some of the, uh, the many things that I was able to experience during, those tra during my travel. I also went to Nigeria in 2020 and got back just in time um, before we actually had to close down and had to go into uh, closing. So this is a, a piece that has been hanging in my house forever. I think I did it in 2003. Uh, the curator came to my house and she saw it and I said, well, it's never left my house. It's never left my wall. And she said, well, I think it would be appropriate uh, for you to uh, put this in the show. So this is called The Maiden, The Protector, and The Offering of Eggs. And it's done in reference to Lucy, uh, the first human allegedly found in Kenya at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, it is scientifically, Lucy scientifically is the oldest living fossil that was found, that has been found thus far. And so uh, what I did was, uh, the offering of eggs represent the seven continents. The protector is, heck, the man hasn't been found yet. He hasn't been found <laughs> yet. So he's a protector. But it, I kind of thought about the Garden of Eden at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. So this is all imaginative as to you know, where she was actually found. And uh, as I said before, it was something uh, that I wanted to express uh, about uh, humankind and the beginning of humankind. This piece is called Roadside Service. And this piece uh, actually depicts some of the scenery that I saw while I was in Ghana. Ghana was the first, I, I think I told you before, Ghana was the first African country that I had the uh, pleasure of, of visiting. And I was just amazed to see uh, how, the, how the people walk in the traffic to, uh, to sell their wares. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that was so impressive to me was the fact that you saw so many different kinds of, of re represent representations of religion. Uh, this, this girl in the forefront actually is Islamic, or she's of the Muslim faith. And the people in the background, they could be traditional, they could be Christian. But one of the things that impressed me so much was that they all got along so well and that they were all out there just together doing their daily, daily vendoring, you know, and uh, you didn't have to worry about going to uh, a drive-in or going to a store, because if you wanted lunch, you could just 
get it right out. Just, just, just get it right off the street because they were. This lady has bread, and they, they have different kinds of things that they that they barter or you know that they offer, they vendor and so forth. And uh, the traffic is always kind of backed up. There's always a lot of people to to purchase whatever their wares are. So uh, this was just such an impressive thing, and I thought the girl was so pretty because of the different colors. She's selling palm oil. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that she had such a pretty um, outfit on, and I really wanted to capture her. I thought she was beautiful. Jane, I have a question. Yes. Did you photograph her? I photographed her. This is, this is a copy of a photograph. A lot of my work is, uh, uh, comes from photographs, you know, or sometimes memory. Uh, my, my latest work um, that you'll probably see, a lot of this is, is coming from my memory or coming from my imagination. Actually, the first piece that you saw was my imagination. Wow. That was my imagination. Wow. And so, uh, but this piece actually came from a photograph. Nice. One of the things, um, Haitian artist, educator, Patrick Nose came and he saw your work and this one spoke to him. And basically he interpreted this one, the young lady, how you captured her with her hands She's kind of pensive and worried. He's saying she has not sold anything. So she's probably... <laughs> it looks full. Yes. Cool. yes, yes. So she's kind of worried with the hand gesture. Yes. So this one is very nice, yeah. I'm so happy that he was able to pick up that. Mm -hmm. uh, that and again, you know, I think he was right on target when he said that uh, she looks a little pensive and yeah. a little worried about, you know, what she's doing. I think also the fact that she's Islamic yes. and she was aware that we were taking the picture. Mm. And a lot of times they they will let you take the picture, but we didn't and we were leaning out of a car when we took the picture. So we didn't actually have an opportunity to say, hey, can I take your picture? So that might have been another factor into why she was, you know, a little bit uneasy. Yes. Very nice. But she was beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. This is called Ghanaian Breakfast, and this is acrylic on canvas. And actually, this is a friend of mine. I actually spoke to her yesterday. Um, I thought that she was just uh, very beautiful, and she allowed me to use a, a photograph of her to do this, this picture. She's actually making breakfast. Uh, she does this every day. And, and I'm saying, oh my goodness. And, and I'm just wondering how in the world she's not burning her feet because this is the heat. This is the heat source here. But anyway, it was just, it was so beautiful uh, in Ghana. The sun shines every day, every day. It's usually anywhere from, from 94 to 96 degrees. And so it's a constant. So I wanted to make sure that I recognize the sunshine as well because it's, it's always sunshine. Um, so this is, uh, my friend's name actually is Asantawa, and uh, she's, she's preparing breakfast for her family. I love also the beautiful colored uh, skirt that she had on, and uh, I thought that uh, it was worthy of being captured. This is called thirst quenching, and of course there are uh, coconut trees everywhere. And, and you'll see vendors, uh, you know, they'll shimmy up the tree and they'll be on the side of the road with the coconuts and so forth. So um, on this particular day, this, this young girl apparently was thirsty and the coconut milk is always so pure and so good. So again, this is uh, uh, an acrylic uh, piece that I did. The background is acrylic pour which I have uh, tried to develop as of late, and I'm getting better and better with it as time goes by. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, I was able to um, put, a, put her, impose her on a background that would be worthy and colorful enough uh, for, for everybody to enjoy. So this is a, a young Ghanaian girl enjoying the flavor of natural coconut milk. And, uh, she, you see it, as I said before, it's readily available on the streets of Ghana. This piece is so, was so important to me, and I just um, had to make sure that it was a part of uh, 
the exhibit uh, because of so many things that have been happening in the country. Uh, our country actually has been in an upheaval. And not only the country, but I think it's that the, the upheaval has impacted the world. So this one re uh, relates to Black Lives Matter. And of course, it was a movement that swept the, the, the world in the summer of 2020 uh, when George, George Floyd was, uh, was killed. Uh, it's so important to me because I, I am a mother of black children, sons, and daughters. And uh, I really feel that uh, our children have really been under assault for a long time, as long as I can remember. Uh, and I think that uh, the fact that Black Lives Matter was able to tell the world, tell the world that we need to change. Not so much that uh, we're against police, we're not against police, but we're against the, the action of some policemen. And we just, we're just, just looking for fairness in all. So as a black mother and grandmother of black sons and daughters, I feel the need to make a strong statement uh, that my children matter. My children matter very much. And I want them to have all of the, the, uh, the whatever the, the country has to offer, I want them to be uh, able to, to enjoy it too. Uh, the education, uh, the health, the housing, Whatever the country offers, I think it's very important that, that my children um, make sure that, that they have access to, uh, to it. So it was really important. This is a watercolor, and um, the mother is, again, she is, uh, she's pensive, she's thinking, she's thinking about it. But the, the, the colors, the sun is in the background, and of course we've got a hodgepodge of colors here. But life is colorful, and we want to make sure that, that we understand and keep it colorful for everybody. So uh, this, this was my contribution, and it was very important to me. One of the people that came to see the exhibit, the first thing he asked was, well, what, does, what does butterflies have to do with the rest of the exhibit? Well, again, this is one that I insisted on having. Um, I think that in 2020, so many of us experienced loss. Relatives, close friends, uh, acquaintances. And I too experienced loss of my best friend. I grew up as a military dependent. And um, I moved so quickly, I didn't have a chance to make friends. Every 18 months to two years, my family moved. But my friend was my brother because he was sharing that experience with me. And um, he has been my lifelong force. He's been there behind me. Uh, even as I was preparing for this exhibit, uh, I miss Michael so much. He died in September. And he died suddenly of a heart attack. And uh, I didn't think that I could go on because I had lost my only, my best friend, my brother. And, uh, one of the things that Michael had done prior to his death was he had built a butterfly garden in his backyard. And so I would go over and all these butterflies, monarchs and all the butterflies would be flying all around in his backyard. So after he died, one day I was in the backyard, in my backyard, and I was just, just, just very upset about losing my brother. I was, I was weeping, I was crying. And this monarch came and started encircling my head. <laughs> and I stopped crying because he, he caught my attention. And I said, well, wait a minute. So I associated that with Michael, <laughs> that Michael was coming to tell me that he was OK. Wow. So in, order, in, in honor of Michael, I wanted to make sure that the butterflies would be an important part of this exhibit. Because I, it, I, it was such a big loss for me. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't. Have, I had acquaintances. I never had really friends. But Michael. So this is to honor Michael and salute to my brother Michael. Mm -hmm. And what medium is this, Jane? This actually is dyed on silk with wax resist. 
this is a batik, and uh, it's uh, it's one of my favorite ones because it turned out really well. Uh, I love batik because batik has its own way of doing what it wants mm -hmm. to do. So you'll see shadows and you'll see all kinds of things. Not that I necessarily put them in there, but it decided that's what it wanted to look like when it finished after it dried and so mm -hmm. forth. And so I just I just love the way that this piece came out. You can see the little little dots here and so forth. All of the white part is the wax resist, and the other part is the uh, the dye that I applied. This piece is called the banjo player, and it's uh, oil on canvas. Um, this guy was one of the entertainers that it, that actually entertained us the first night that we got to Ghana. There was a ceremony, a welcoming ceremony, and um, we had a big dinner, and we had, a, again, in Ghana, we had a, a renaming ceremony where they came in. Uh, one of the things about Ghana, though, um, whatever your name is remains, but they just incorporate the date of the week that you're born on. So I was born on a Thursday, and my um, Ghanaian name is Jane Yah. Yah is Thursday in, in Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I, I wanted to make sure that um, I captured him because I found out that actually the banjo is original to West Africa. Mm -hmm. It's an original in instrument, and it's used so much here in the United States, you know, in different forms, but primarily country music. But, you know, it's just uh, one of those things that was brought over probably um, during, during slavery time and um, was just, um, just, just fit right within the, the, uh, the culture here. And it just became a part of the culture. So uh, this guy was just, he was, he was very entertaining. Uh, he made sure that we had a good time. And of course, he, you can see that he was enjoying it as well. And again, this one is named, this one is just signed by Jalili because I did it in, in uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. The colors are incredible. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show the movement, mm -hmm. you know, and I was trying to capture the movement that was going on in the, um, the celebration. It's beautiful. This one is called the Daggery Ear Doctor. I tried to capture this lady. This is sort of a mixed media. I've got a little pastel in it. I've got a pencil. Uh, I think I have a little acrylic in it. It's, it's sort of mixed media. It is mixed media. It's on, on, um, on paper. Um, I had the good fortune to meet the herb doctor in a small fishing village in Nigeria. And the name of the village was called Badagari. Uh, we were uh, standing on the beach, and I saw this lady, you know, mature lady, bouncing down the beach. Well, first and foremost, uh, they had actually never seen an African American in this town, in, in Badagari. So they had seen white Americans, but they had never seen, we had never ventured that far, you know, into uh, inland to, to Badagari. And so she heard that I was there, and she was just overjoyed. She wanted to meet me. So she's bouncing, she's running, bouncing down the beach. And then when she uh, got upon me, it was, she, she was just so, so welcoming and so welcoming. It was like she came up to me and she said, where have you been? Where have you been? And I was just like, I was just, I was just, just taken aback. Uh, I think there's a later picture of me with her. And all of, there was so much in, information in Badagari. Uh, for the first time, I'd also heard of, uh, that uh, the Africans had, had gotten into the, the slave, the market, and they were selling. Um, and in Badagari, actually, I did, right before I met her, I went to this museum, and there were all of these artifacts, and I got to actually take a picture of a face of an of a African that sold us into mm -hmm. slavery. And mm -hmm. so it was just, just, just very emotional. The, the town and the experience was just so emotional. And even my guy, who, who, is, is, who is an African, even he, was, he got emotional because he did not understand that the trade became, had become commercial and that 
you know, people had bought into it, and so they were, they were just, you know, raiding some of the villages, and they were selling us. And so uh, when she came and she was like, where have you been? It was like my face became all of the emotion that I had felt. Just was just etched into my face, wow. you know. The happiness, the sadness, the pain, everything was just etched into my face. Wow. But I was just so happy to see this woman because she was so warm and welcoming. And it was like again, she was saying, "Hey, I missed you. Where have you been?" Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that her face <laughs> would always be a memory of mine, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because she was just. She was just outstanding. She was just spectacular, and 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 the experience itself again was so was such an emotional experience for me. So, this is the Bedaggery Herb Doctor. Mm -hmm. This is our Lagos Marketplace. The energy in Nigeria is youthful. Mm -hmm. Youthful. I mean, it is just. It is just off the chain. Well, when I went to uh, the marketplace, because I blended in so well, I was overwhelmed by the numbers of people, the number of people that I saw. And they were like coming at me like a, like a tidal wave. I mean, the marketplace is just that full and people are energized. And so the, the person that I was with, with said to me, she, she was Nigerian, she said, Mama, hold my hand. Do not let go of my hand. Well, the reason why she told me was because if I had been swept away, it would have been very difficult for them to find me because I looked so, I, I was home. I looked just like them. They looked wow. just like me. Wow. And I was home. So she said, Mama, I know that you're not used to seeing so, so many d different, you know, th this, this, tidal wave of people, and it's youthful. And I said, no, she said, mama, and I'm like this, I'm like this, I mean, my eyes are this big, I'm looking at, at the people, I'm looking at the, 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 the variations uh, that I saw, you know, in the people, I'm looking at everything that I've, I've read about Nigeria, and uh, she said, don't let go of my hand, mama, hold on to my hand. And I, I grasped her hand, and I did not let go. But the marketplace, in the marketplace, you can find everything in the marketplace. The Chinese have come in, and, and just like they, they're here, made in China. Well, in Africa, a lot of stuff is made in China. Okay. And, and not only that, um, you do have uh, artisans. You do have, have the, the, you know, the, the uh, native artisans and so forth. But uh, a lot of times, uh, it's so commercial. It's so commercial. Uh, a lot of now the fabric. This is a, this is an example of some of the fabric that that would actually be made and designed in Africa itself. And so I tried to put that in there. But I mean, they sell everything from the kitchen sink. You know, they sell everything, and I was just overwhelmed by uh, by everything that I was seeing. Uh, I had been to the marketplace in. Uh, Kumasi, Kumasi is in Ghana, and that's the second largest city. Um, I was really impressed by the size of the marketplace in Kumasi because as far as the eye could see, there were vendors. And not only that, in the middle of the marketplace was a mosque, there was a Christian place, there were, and there were traditional, I mean, and these people were, I mean, it, they were just like this, mm -hmm. just like this. And everybody was getting along. Another thing that I, I wanted to say, uh, I never saw anybody truly out of control. I'm not saying that they weren't out of control, but I never saw it. I never saw anybody smoke a cigarette. I never saw any, any kind of uh, behavior that you normally would see here. And I'm sure they smoke cigarettes, but I did not see it in all of my travels in Africa, in, in Nigeria, or uh, in Ghana, I didn't see, you know, cigarettes. Everybody there, though, including the newborn babies, have phones. <laughs> Everybody has a phone. So, uh, it, it's just amazing. It was just an amazing uh, trip for me. Hope to go back soon. <laughs>
This is this is definitely one of my favorites. I love anything marketplace where people are congregating and you really get a full view of what the community, the city, um, who lives there. This this is definitely one of my favorites. Yeah, uh, at the marketplace, you in, in, in Lagos, you, you have people that actually live there, um, and then you have people coming in from the countryside as well. But you know, it's a, it's a it's a blend. Mm -hmm. Great people watching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My guy kept saying, "Why aren't you taking pictures?" I'm standing there with the camera, like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> Why aren't you taking pictures? I said, "I'm absorbing all of this. Yeah. You take the pictures, you know, <laughs> because I was trying to absorb." everything that I was seeing in the culture and so forth. Um, and uh, it really did mean a lot. It really meant, meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. This is a piece that uh, I did at Cree all day. And uh, this is called Maasai Woman. And uh, I had actually had a picture of a Maasai Woman. And uh, this was actually I, one of my first, first pieces of sculpture that I did. Uh, David Cumbie was my teacher and he is phenomenal because he, he, he puts it there and then he walks away from you and says, go do it, you know. And, and I just love the way that he, uh, he challenges you to, uh, uh, to go forth and, and do your own thing. So, uh, you know, he's, he's there if you need him, but, but basically, you know, he te teaches you to use your own mind. So this was, this was the uh, result of that class. I ended up uh, making a mold of her. So this is a Paris, uh, a plaster of Paris mold that I made. And again, I went back and I, I could change her features and I embellished her. So this is an embellished woman. And uh, she is um, uh, from the tribe of South Africa in South Africa. And I, and I just loved, uh, I tried to uh, emulate some of the, uh, some of their, their houses are just, just so ornate because the women paint the houses, and not only do they paint them, but they, they decorate them in, you know, with the different symbols and so forth. So um, this, was, this, was a, this was a fun piece to do. This is called Queen, and this is an acrylic pour, an embellished acrylic pour. Uh, if you can get close enough to it, you can see all of the different cells um, that you're looking for when, when one does an acrylic pour. Uh, and you take it, it the, all of the cells just rise to the top, different colors and so forth. So this was, uh, again, something that I have been experimenting as late and trying to uh, get my footing on. And uh, this one just came out just right. Uh, I was able to actually, as an artist, I see a figure uh, in the pour, and that was what, what guided me actually in, in uh, outlining Queen. So uh, this was very enjoyable, and uh, again, uh, this was this was something that uh, um, that I really enjoyed doing, and that I look, will be doing in the future. Hopefully, getting bigger and bigger pieces. This is the uh, cover piece that was used in the invitation. Uh, this is a picture of Mr. Arthur Rayford, who was a really dynamic uh, artist. Um, he's deceased now. But he was actually one of my mentors. And I met Mr. Rayford in 1990 when I uh, uh, returned to the area. And I was just, just fascinated. His pieces were gigantic. And uh, I remember he had an exhibit uh, in, over in the land, and he had three floors of huge paintings. I don't know what happened to them, but I mean huge. He talked about all kinds of subject matter. But he used to tease me, because I, I would show him some of my, my early work, and he would say to me, girl, you can't paint, girl, <laughs> you can't draw. But he always did it in a loving way it, as if it was a challenge, you know. Okay, you, are you sure? Girl, you can't do that. So one day, I, I decided that I was going to, to meet his challenge. And I went back, he had done a huge painting of orange picking, of the orange pickers. 
And in the background here, uh, I'm kind of showing that, you know, he's, he, that, was, that was one of the, what the, the subject of his work. And of course we have the, the shuttle going up, you know, and that's Florida. But I decided that uh, I would do, try to do an image of him. Didn't turn out just like him, but it was close enough that he knew, he had, he, he had a very unique appearance. So it was close enough that he knew that it was him. So what I did was, when I finished it, I, I went to Mr. Rayford and I said, BAM! <laughs> Is this you? And he started laughing. We really had a good time talking about this, this piece. You know, but it was all because he challenged me and he kind of wet my appetite that I began, because it wasn't until 1990 that I took it seriously, that I, that I might have this talent. And uh, I've grown, oh my God, for uh, tremendously since that time. But uh, I wanted to make sure, I think this was done in 1995, but I had met him in, in, in about 1990. So uh, this was Mr. Arthur Rayford. He was, he was an exceptional artist. This man had done everything in life that one could ever do. So uh, he was a good friend. The Ailey Dancer um, was an idea that was given to me by a very close friend. She had a picture of an Ailey Dancer, and it was somewhat like this. So she knew that I was uh, taking sculpting at uh, Crealde. So she came to me and she said, do this. I bet you can't do this. Well, I like challenges. I like for people to challenge me. And I said, I bet you I can. She said, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, if you talk to her today, she won't remember that she gave me that picture, <laughs> but she actually did. So I started out doing the Ailey Dancer with David Cumbie. David showed me, you know, how to do the armature and so forth. The armature actually is just a rod that runs all the way up to his head. It's just a rod, and then I went ahead and, you know, um, built him around the rod. Um, at one point, uh, there was, for some reason or another, there were things that were happening in my family. For, for, for some reason or another, I, I stopped going to uh, Creole Day. And uh, when I did go back, one of the, I had worked on it, and I had not formed the legs right. <laughs> and I went in and I showed David, and David took a saw and cut my leg off. <laughs> <laughs> But I trusted David enough for him to do that. I wasn't upset about him doing that because I knew that he that I had probably just not gotten uh, anatomically correct. I had st I still had not had been able to not anatomically, but I still had not been able to um, put it together like it was supposed to be. So I went home and I, I studied and I, I, I worked on it and I worked on it. It took me quite a while because this is done out of polymer paper clay. And uh, I would work on it and then I would say, oh no, I'm not going in the right direction. I would take it apart and I, I would work on it a little bit. So it took me, it took me quite a while for me to, to get in there. Most people think that this is bronze. It is, it's a bronze paint. Mm. This is a bronze paint that I, I put over him. And uh, again, my brother Michael was the one that <laughs> helped me to, to, to put the base on there and so forth. So, uh, you know, I had a lot of people around me. My brother was, I guess, he, I, he, he, he was one, kind of one of my number one fans, you know. He, he would uh, always encourage me, well, Jane, what do you need, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the Ailey Dancer actually figured very prominently uh, in, in getting this, this uh, uh, base on and getting, getting it together. So I thank David. <laughs> I thank David. and. Uh, I probably will be seeing him in the future <laughs> to do some more art, to do some more early dancers. But um, this has always been a very favorite piece of mine, and uh, I've been very protective of it. So, you know, but uh, this is it. Alvin Ailey. Uh, Al I don't know if anybody, a lot of people might not know who Alvin mm -hmm. Ailey was, but Alvin Ailey w had a, a dance group, and actually he, they're, they're still performing. Al Alvin is, has, is deceased. But uh, they come annually uh, to uh, Bob Carr or the uh, 
uh, the centers to, to perform. And uh, it's a dance troupe out of New York. And uh, luckily, uh, even my granddaughter who took dance, and she was able to actually study with them one summer and so forth. So Alvin Ailey has, has been uh, a prominent, he's, he's been in my life for a long time. So I was just honored to be able to try to duplicate some of uh, uh, the moves that some of his uh, dancers make. Barbara Tiffany encouraged me to put this one in. This was a, a play toy. And what I was trying to do was I, I was just, just messing around. I had done an acrylic pour in the background and I was embellishing her. And I went and I found some old beer cans and I wanted to put some found objects in there. So I cut them out and made her earrings and her necklace and so forth. And uh, I want to actually move toward using more found objects. Uh, I, my, my mind tells me that there's so many facets of art out there that I'm all, my, it's mind boggling. You know, you uh, look at documentaries and it was like, they're doing this, you know, and they're doing that. And every day a new technique seems to spring up from nowhere. And I, I'm just, just fascinated by it. And uh, some of them, you know, I, I'm challenged to, to try to, to work on. So this was my play toy. I was, I was trying to, to and, and Barbara said, well, wait a minute, we can put this in. Barbara Tiffany said, we can put this in. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, this is called Madame. These guys uh, were uh, the entertainment uh, committee for our first night in Ghana. We were welcomed. It was a welcoming celebration. And they performed for us. And uh, I tried to uh, put as many colors in this piece, this is an acrylic piece, as I could, because again, the energy was just bouncing off the wall. And uh, the guys were so energetic and, and so welcoming, so, so warm. They were, you know, they were happy to see us and they were doing their best to make sure that we understood that. And uh, so they played for us. We had a, had a big dinner and uh, they played for us for, and, and not only did they play for us, they, they, they did, uh, they danced for us. and. They, they sang, they did a whole lot of different things to, to welcome us to Ghana. And so I tried, again, I tried to make sure that I put uh, the colors in there to uh, uh, talk about the electrifying energy that was in the room that night. This is a batik. Uh, this is a dye on silk with wax resist. And uh, this is something that I kind of did impromptu uh, I was taking a class in, in uh, batik, and uh, I was just motivated. You can see that I, I keep naming everything Maasai, so <laughs> I'm going to have to find out more more names for uh, some of my paintings and so forth. But uh, I really thoroughly enjoy doing this uh, with the three maidens and so forth. And uh, again, when, where you see the white and so forth, that's where the the wax was and then I uh, later came back and I put the uh, the d different colors in there uh, inside of the wax so uh, this was uh, fun to do I'm still working on uh, uh, batik and still you know uh, experimenting with uh, different processes and so forth you grow and one of the things I, again I, I have to say about batik is that it takes a life of its own it's a uh, it's like a watercolor, you know, a watercolor kind of take, takes a life of its own. You can put whatever you want to, but ultimately when it dries, it's going to dry the way it wants to dry. And that's the same with batik. Batik, uh, they, it'll run or it'll do whatever it wants to do. And usually uh, you, you and the batik are, on, on, are, are of one accord because you usually you like what comes out. So. But uh, this is this was a favorite this was a favorite pastime of mine, so uh, I truly enjoyed doing that. Okay, this is the final piece, and it's called Flame. Uh, it's uh, something. It was an impromptu piece. Uh, I had some some wax, and I just put it on there and see what would come up. And this is this is the, the result of it. Again, uh, a batik dye on silk and uh, 
it runs, it runs, it, it does its own thing, it makes the shadows. You don't ha always have to put shadows in there because it's going to make its own shadows and its own. But whatever happens, it ends up being just, just very beautiful. Like this is something that it did on its own there. You know, you start looking at it. And uh, I just love love doing batik. Mm -hmm. So this was a sort of impromptu. I just, just did that very quickly. I chose the title for this exhibit, The Evolution of an Artist, simply because of the fact that when you see my work, you're going to see many names. Uh, it's almost like I have evolved. In the spirit of Sankofa, and I wore this particularly, um, this is an Adinkra symbol that means positive reversion, that it is not a taboo to go back and claim what is rightfully yours. When I first started out, I would always sign my word Jane, and I thought about it. So I felt that my ancestors were somehow involved in who I was becoming. So I decided that I would change the name from Jane to, and add Lily, Jane Lily. One was my maternal grandmother, and the other was my paternal great-grandmother. And so that, for, for many years, I would sign my work, Jane Lilly, to honor my ancestors. Uh, over time, it became a contraction to Jill Lilly. And then I just started signing my, my work, Jill Lilly. Uh, however, in 2020, I went to Nigeria, and I was adopted by the Yorubas. I was given a formal uh, um, name, naming ceremony, and they changed my name to Omalara Ramoki Adini. And from that time on, I decided that my work would always be signed Omalara from here on out. So when you see my work in 2020, the latter part of uh, 2020, in the beginning of 2021, the name Omalara will be the signature. And uh, it's a name that I'm very proud of. As again, again, it's in the spirit of Sankofa. Go back and retrieve what is rightfully yours. Thank you.